Hello, good afternoon. I'm Allison Brooks, Executive Director of the Bay Area Regional Collaborative, and I served as chair of the uh, Resilient by Design Bay Area Challenge. You are joining the third webinar in a six series, six webinar series uh, acknowledging or celebrating, uh, marking the time, the two year anniversary of uh, the Resilient by Design Bay Area Challenge, which was modeled after Rebuild by Design. And I am um, delighted to be working with Amy Chester, the Managing Director of Rebuild by Design on this effort. And I want to thank also Zoe Siegel, who is staff uh, to the to RBD, who's now working at Greenbelt Alliance for helping with this, as well as Lucian Go, the BARC program coordinator. Today, you're going to hear from a great uh, set of, of um, designers and architects working on projects in the Bay Area who were uh, very involved in Resilient by Design. And they're going to be moderated by uh, Amy Hutzel, who is the Deputy Executive Director of the State Coastal Conservancy and who is also Vice Chair of Resilient by Design. It was great to work with her over this project. Um, and I just want to make a few notes. If you have questions, uh, please do share those over uh, the course of the presentation. Uh, we would uh, prefer if you could put them in the Q&A section rather than chat just so we can manage them and make sure we can um, get to them as, as quickly as possible. And um, for those of you who are planning on joining all six of these webinars over the full series, you're going to get some kind of special acknowledgement at the end of this. So thank you for everybody who's um, participating. Uh, it's, um, and, and I'm going to hand it over to Amy. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. And um, I want to thank everybody who's uh, joining us today for uh, this panel on the role of creeks and natural shoreline solutions in resiliency. Um, and I know it was great uh, experience for me to participate in Resilient by Design. Um, and we're going to be hearing from um, several of the um, the designers who were involved with Resilient by Design in the Bay Area. Uh, I want to again thank all of you for joining us. I want to thank Allison Brooks and Amy Chester and Lucian Go for all the um, thought and work that's gone into this webinar series celebrating the two-year anniversary of, of RBD. And I also really want to thank <coughs> the three speakers <coughs> today. Um, for their role in Resilient by Design and for their ongoing efforts uh, to increase resiliency of our shoreline and creeks and of our communities, really working um, with nature uh, to increase resiliency around San Francisco Bay. And I'm going to do a quick introduction for the three of them, and then uh, they will each uh, speak. Um, we'll have some panel uh, discussion questions uh, after that and then open it up to Q&A. And again, if you can put your questions in the Q&A and not in the chat, that would, that would help us. Um, John Gibbs is gonna speak first. He's a principal at WRT. He's a landscape architect and urban designer whose practice is anchored in the social and ecological processes of our cities and natural areas. Uh, and he served as a re research advisor for RBD and Thanks for doing that. Uh, Gina Worth is with SCAPE. She's a registered landscape architect and the design principal at SCAPE. She works with cities, community advocates, and landowners to reveal the ecological and cultural potential of public landscapes. And then Richard Mullane with Hassel is an architect, urban designer, and urban planner with extensive experience leading multidisciplinary teams. He's worked in London, Sydney, and Shanghai before relocating to the Bay Area to establish Hassel's first studio in the USA. And apologies if you can hear a 10-year-old in the background. But with this, I'm going to mute and turn it over to John. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and begin to share my screen. We're going to do this very seamlessly. We are practiced, and with that, my screen should be uh, should be sharing. It is such a pleasure uh, to be here and to uh, be part of this moment of continuing uh, 
the uh, the momentum of the resilient by design challenge in San Francisco from a couple years ago. Uh, there was such camaraderie and uh, advancement of of, um, of a collaborative spirit of intellectual thought um, at the time. And I think today, as we're um, in our era of COVID and, and, um, um, and separation, I really miss that time. So these kinds of moments are really fun for coming together um, around the, this common topic. Um, I'm gonna be presenting just a, a couple of, of projects very briefly. Um, and I just wanted to touch on a, on a couple of themes. I think the, the, uh, the interesting components of, um, of funding and how we're gonna be funding these kinds of projects moving forward. These are very uh, real everyday projects with real clients, real budgets, real challenges uh, in real places. And um, I think the funding becomes pretty important. There's also really interesting integration of ecology and mobility in a couple of these projects. And I think we're gonna see those themes uh, here today. Um, and there's the ongoing reality of, of how do we pay for these and how do we plan for um, these sorts of improvements over various planning horizons. Um, and so those real world challenges are very much embedded in here. Uh, I just really wanna thank um, RBD. I wanna thank uh, the other panelists and I wanna thank my clients um, for allowing me to present this work and, and entrusting us with this, with this effort, as well as Poonam Narkar and Christina Bejarano from, from WRT as they're kind of very integral here on, in these projects. I um, just wanted to begin with the, I think building off of Resilient by Design that it's not just about one thing, it's about systems and infrastructure, it's about public health and, and our access to open spaces, it's about economics. Um, and I think to really underscore the point that it's about people and we need to pay extra attention to bring equity into this dialogue um, to make sure all communities are brought along as we face um, the, the, uh, the effects of climate change and sea level rise in particular. I'm gonna begin up in the County of Marin with a project um, really led by the um, uh, Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy, uh, Marin County Parks, uh, and through their, their collaboration of One TAM. The, the, uh, those are really the client groups in addition to the Coastal Conservancy. Funding here is from Measure A, um, but also Caltrans and the Adaptation uh, Planning Grants. Um, the nature of this project is one of marsh restoration and of trail access, and it requires really the dual leadership, both in planning and design of landscape architecture through WRT, uh, but ESA is a really important key partner and they're really leading the restoration effects here. Um, so I'm diving into this project before I go to the next one, which, which really zooms out. Uh, in this project, we have a very complex marsh system in Richardson's Bay, tucked in here is the entrance to Muir Woods, um, uh, access over to, to beaches uh, here in the distance. There's a lot of transportation influences. Um, we're looking very specifically at the marsh and at the trail. Um, the marsh is, is currently um, in decline. Um, this is a, a remnant marsh, uh, which was uh, established as it migrated as the upland areas were developed. Um, the, uh, there's two creeks that flow into Richardson's Bay delivering very limited amounts of sediment and sediment becomes really important as we look more closely at Coyote Creek and the fact that any sediment that is coming down is really bypassing the marsh. The marsh is not projected to keep up pace with sea level rise. Uh, the level of accretion is, is extremely low. So we have a marsh in decline, uh, not keeping pace with sea level rise, and we have a bay trail. We have an old railroad embankment or levee, um, which is currently inundated and overtopped. Um, the need to simply repair this to uh, replace the asphalt surface uh, requires great permitting expense and effort, and in fact triggers a requirement to uh, elevate the marsh uh, to be resilient to a mid-century point. So right in there becomes this really important story of how do you save a marsh? How do you understand the co-benefits between this levee as a protection of the marsh uh, related to southern storm wave vetch, fetch and uh, the erosive effects of waves into the marsh, um, but also recognize that the lack of, um, of influence, tidal influence in and out of this marsh, the reduced tidal prism uh, is, is, is you know, another effect, uh, a negative effect of the Bay Trail and that existing levee. 
So looking more specifically uh, at the height of that trail, uh, we see a resilience goal of mid-century, so which is uh, mid-century sea level rise plus a hundred year storm flood. It's about five feet of additional elevation that that, that, that trail would need, um, uh, would need to be raised in order to mitigate that effect. And we're right at the point now in our process as we're, we're really midway um, where we're gonna, we're starting to see some co-benefits. We're starting to see the ideas of a raised, uh, a raised embankment of ecotone slope, um, and looking at the level of investment that it would take to achieve that, both through permitting as well as through the dollars and cents and the cost, and what measure of resilience um, we would we would. Um, have um, as we were trying to protect the marsh. But of course, we looked beyond that to end of century um, and we see even a, a five foot uh, elevation gain in the, in the height of the trail would still not be resilient to end of century. And so we're also looking at elevated bridge structures. We're looking at uh, rerouting the trail um, and the broader effects of sea level rise as you look um, out into that time horizon. Um, so really interesting process for, for where we are today and, and where we're going to be going. The engagement has been really interesting and, and just huge credit to the client group who's done um, really all the legwork associated with the engagement, uh, the number of tours, uh, the number of, of students, um, folks from Marin City, folks from across Marin County that have come out to learn about the ecology of the marsh. And there's great consensus that something needs to be done, but there's uh, a great lack of clarity, and it's really the goal of our project to provide that roadmap for um, how this project could move forward, what's the right level of investment to provide protective measures for what planning horizon. So I wanna shift gears now and go over to the East Bay shoreline um, and huge credit to East Bay Regional Park District as the client that's looking at um, sea level rise impacts to the Bay Trail through really the entire 40 miles of, of East Bay shoreline. Interestingly, this project is funded by uh, Caltrans and a transportation grant. It's really because of the, rec the recognition of the trail as, um, as a mobility uh, function and something to be protected. Um, but of course, it's never that easy. And so again, we have a team of, of restoration ecologists, the coastal engineers, we have Arab in terms of engineering, but also really detailed um, skill sets in risk assessment. Our friends at SFEI and leveraging the great work that they do around the Bay, um, very specifically to, to this project. And, and Alexis Robert from, from uh, On Climate assisting us with partnerships and strategies for, for funding. So, one of the stories about this project is you have 42 miles of, of or sort of over 40 miles of shoreline, you have two counties, multiple cities, and a lot of additional miles just of, of trails along this corridor. So how does East Bay Regional Park District prioritize where it should be directing the greatest number, uh, greatest resources to protection? And so therein really becomes our, our project. We have a fixed budget um, we've got to cover a lot of territory and we need to deliver uh, a number of succinct priorities. So leveraging um, the OLUs from, um, from SFEI, the additional work of adapting to rising tides, um, leveraging that work is becomes, becomes really important for being able to move projects along efficiently uh, in our San Francisco Bay Area. And there's a great body of work that is out there. Um, maybe there'll be a few comments and questions later about how we some of the gaps in that as we've, as we've begun to look at the varied conditions. So with all that acreage and mileage, um, how do we really bring this process through in a succinct way? So we begin with an analysis of the full shoreline and I'll click through some of that uh, research very, you know, very quickly. We then moved into a risk assessment, narrowing down the priority segments to do additional work on and ultimately developing a list of about three specific projects um, that really represent the highest priority to East Bay Regional Park District. Um, we're going to leave them and, and we began with very high level guidance um, across all of those trail segments. We developed a set of goals that were both quantitative and importantly were qualitative. We have an incredible brain trust on the team as well as within the client group. Um, so we looked very specifically at hazards and restoration potential. We looked at maintenance. We understood the disadvantaged communities that both rely on the trail for transportation, but also rely on the trail for public access and access to 
uh, to, to public health benefits of these areas. We mapped pretty extensively um, in a number of different ways, and this data set was looking very specifically at both uh, tidal inundation uh, from um, uh, storm and, and tides and sea level rise, but also adding the data set from uh, UC Berkeley and others um, related to groundwater. Um, so mapping this, we begin to see impacts to trails, but as you can also imagine, we begin to see lots of other impacts all along the East Bay shoreline. And we have a client that is a parks department. And I think that one of the project, one of the things that this project raises is, you know, there's lots of impacts and it's going to take a lot of different partners. East Bay Regional Park District can't go this alone. Uh, and that starts to come out through some of the partnerships and strategies that Alexis Robert has been helping us with uh, as we move into more, um, more specific site specific projects. Uh, we looked at the restoration potential. So we looked at nature based adaptation strategies in addition to just simply a trail. We weren't interested simply in armoring uh, and protecting things in place, but looking at um, uh, where there was uh, uh, adaptive and nature based solutions. Um, where do we need, where do we have ongoing maintenance issues? So very near term concerns, critical infrastructure. When we looked very specifically at disadvantaged communities all along the East Bay shoreline and how that began to weigh in and, and factor into priority segments of the project. Uh, Jack Hogan from Arup uh, did just a terrific job with his team looking at the risk assessment and they led a very specific process on the eight sites that we had narrowed it down to. Um, and they moved through a very technical process looking at a whole series of coefficients related to hazards, related to vulnerability, uh, consequence, and ultimately a compilation of risk assessment. We took that data um, forward into then a series of priority sites. So the MLK Shoreline, Alameda Point, Coyote Hills, and in Hayward, those were really the, the, top, um, the top projects. Interestingly, um, Gina is going to be speaking next about the Hayward shoreline. And last week, uh, we heard from um, uh, friends at Methune talking about North Richmond. So there's actually a lot of, uh, a lot of nice overlap and support that, that this rigorous analysis uh, lends, lends to work that's already been done. Um, ultimately, we're going to be moving forward with um, specific concepts for specific sites and importantly looking at the partnerships because again, this is not about East Bay Regional Park District going it alone, um, but how do they join forces with the um, uh, other assets, whether it's Port of Oakland or it's the city of Alameda or in the case of uh, East Shore State Park, a joint ad adjacent um, cities, communities, the state of California and certainly um, within the MLK shoreline, uh, we're right adjacent to the airport in addition to the, the city of Alameda. And that wraps up my summary of those projects. And I wanna hand it over to Gina. Great. Thank you, John. Um, I'm just gonna bring up my screen here. So hopefully this transitions seamlessly. Um, Perfect. Can you guys see full screen? Great. So thanks so much. Um, that was a really, I think, helpful and very contextualizing presentation, John, and excited to share some related work. Um, I was hoping to share today some of the work that we developed for the Resilient by Design competition and some of the kind of spin-off projects that have really evolved um, from that. Um, I also just wanted to share a little bit about SCAPE. I put this nostalgic photo of our office in here to show a little bit um, of who we are. We're about a 50 person design firm located uh, in New York and New Orleans. We're no longer working in the office, we're working from home, but kind of adapting along with the changing world. And we're composed of a mix of um, landscape architects, architects, urban designers, planners, and horticulturalists all working in a very interdisciplinary way to think about uh, climate change impacts on society and landscapes. So I thought to take a step back and share some of the work developed for Resilient by Design, particularly our public sediment project, um, which I think was really important because it had this nested regional uh, kind of research phase and then a specific project emerge from it. Um, this work was developed with a highly collaborative team led by SCAPE along with many other excellent practitioners in the Bay Area and beyond. Um, and our team really conceived of uh, the Baylands themselves as living infrastructure to be nourished uh, and adapt that can adapt to sea level rise. 
Um, we knew that tidal balins, particularly the marshes and mudflats that line the bay's edge, cushion the urban edges and mitigate the risks of sea level rise um, and are very important uh, infrastructural features in thinking about adapting to sea level rise. Our team, based upon some work of the Dredge Research Collaborative that set up this project, um, had identified that sediment is the building block of resilience in the bay. So this was the thesis that we brought to this approach. Um, and many different uh, scientific uh, practitioners in the Bay Area are really looking at this issue of sediment supply. John, you mentioned it, and I think everyone working in the Bay Area um, on issues of marsh and tidal wetland restoration understand that sediment supply is one important piece of that equation. And that's really because sediment helps build baylands as sea levels rise. Uh, marshes and mudflats and other subtidal ecosystems um, also need to keep pace with that changing water level so they don't drown or transition to other ecosystem types. And a sediment supply coming in from rivers or streams or tributaries um, often helps um, supply that critical sediment to help those marshes grow over time. Um, historically, our, our sediment conditions have really changed from what they once were. Uh, historically, tributaries and the San Joaquin and uh, Sacramento rivers really provided large sediment inputs um, to the bay. But over time, uh, dams and channels, flood control channels, have really trapped and contained sediment and basically divorced the flow of sediment from the flow of water in the bay area. And so uh, regionally, this is a probably out of date graphic because in the last year or so there's been a lot of additional research on this issue still conveying um, some of a kind of similar trends that um, the sediment provided today by the Sacramento and San Joaquin River deltas and the local tributaries of the bay uh, do not provide enough sediment to meet the future potential need to maintain even the existing tidal marshes and mudflats that the bay has today uh, using this uh, time frame of a 2100 3.5 foot sea level rise scenario. And so our team tried to use that existing research and build on it and visualize it, really thinking about how this could trigger transformative regional scale, bayland, ecological and social change. So thinking about this mosaic of ecosystems that lines the bay and how it might transform into a system predominantly composed of mudflats or subtitle ecosystems and flooded communities over time with this loss of uh, or transformation in ecological composition caused by sea level rise. And so our team really decided to take sediment as a design challenge and think about how can we design with mud, but how can we also make this issue of sediment management and supply a, a much more public and debated and discussed issue because often sediment um, still is thought of as a, as a waste product um, and not necessarily thought of as a life giving or uh, ecosystem building material, uh, particularly to I think members of the general public. So this was one of our project goals. And rather than focusing purely on the edge, we find that many sea level rise and adaptation projects focus purely on the edge where those impacts might be most um, apparent. We decided to look upstream to the different tributaries that fed the bay and focus on uh, Alameda Creek, understanding what was once the historical connection between Alameda Creek and its sediment shed and the bay itself, and what is the connection today and what can be done to improve that situation. So we looked at the Alameda Creek um, watershed, began to zoom in on it and really looked at the lower watershed where that channelization is truly happening. Um, the lower watershed uh, once historically was a very large mobile um, alluvial fan. The, the stream system, the creek system really moved across that entire lowland expanse of the South Bay um, and deposited sediment that nourished the marshes. Um, over time, urbanization occurred, uh, show, shown here in pink and uh, that, that creek system was really locked in place, so it no longer could move, it no longer could flood or overtop its banks. The cities of Newark, Union City, and Niles, Canyon, and Fremont developed at its edges, and the Army Corps developed a flood control channel in that area to manage water. Um, but the sediment conditions dramatically changed, and the marshes uh, left at the urban edge uh, became salt ponds used for uh, industrial salt production. Um, and today, as some of these salt ponds are being abandoned and their uses are transitioning into restoration projects, their vulnerabilities are exacerbated by climate change because they don't have that important sediment supply to keep pace with sea level rise. So these are some views looking down that channelized uh, creek corridor. You can really see in this particular study area, but also in many tributaries around the bay, there simply isn't a lot of room to 
reimagine the floodplain to expand out. There's very few places um, that haven't been urbanized up to the very edge of the creek system. So we're working in a very constrained condition. Um, and you see sediment stuck in the channels. So sediment's really building up within these systems um, and not getting out to the far expanses of the bay to nourish and resupply uh, these potential marshes at the edges of the creek um, to, with, with sediment that can help them adapt to climate change. And so we worked with many different, uh, very important partners on this project because really creeks span many of these like multi-jurisdictional boundaries. Water doesn't always necessarily uh, recognize political boundaries or town boundaries or, um, and we had to really think about what the different partners and landowners and decision makers were in this area and try to bring them into a collaborative conversation about how to improve sediment flows and creek health, um, as well as build resilience and engage communities in this area. So this is looking kind of in a more zoomed in way at that flood control channel, um, which as I mentioned was not designed to move sediment, which is why you see it in a very shallow condition today because sediment's built up within it. Um, it was also not designed uh, to do things that creeks once did quite well, which is to provide migration space and pathways for migratory species like, um, like steelhead that once were uh, kind of very historically prevalent on this creek. Um, you can see this is called the BART weir. This is where uh, BART moves over the creek, but also this weir really prevents fish passage within. Um, and while the channel does have these incredible recreational pathways at its edge, the bed of the channel and the creek itself was not really designed or allowed to engage people. And the conception of people today is that this is not a living ecosystem, that this is a piece of infrastructure, something to stay out and away from, not something to recognize or reflect um, as a piece of, um, of a living system. And so our project really attempted to address these kind of three critical issues, uh, encouraging sediment flows down to the bay to build resilient marshes that could both improve ecological connections, but also help reduce the impacts of sea level rise on lowland communities. Um, it strove to improve uh, the social relationship between people and the creek to view it as a resource and use it more as a resource. Um, and it also uh, really strives to improve uh, migratory passage for fish uh, within the channel and within the, the larger bay system itself. And so we collaborated with the flood control district to brainstorm on different ways that the channel itself might be modified and redesigned to really enable these three different conditions to occur. Um, kind of re-sculpting the bed of the channel and stabilizing it with different types of vegetation to encourage a bankful condition that could move more sediment downstream and create a more consistent and sinuous passage for uh, fish migration, particularly steelhead um, and lamprey within the project area. And so these are just some of the, um, but also the kind of current clients of the project or proposed clients of the project that these migratory fish moving both out of the system from upland reserves of steelhead, but also um, uh, migrating adults trying to move to their upstream um, breeding grounds. Uh, so we thought about how we could design different types of kind of modify the channel in different ways where possible create spaces that we called flood rooms that would expand the edges of the levee and create space for um, fish passage and uh, kind of resting spots along the way. Also create a little bit more room within the flood control channel uh, and also create planted pockets and vegetated spaces. Um, we also noticed from a social perspective that in many ways, uh, while the creek uh, for some communities was a beloved recreational resource uh, with the pathways along its edge, the creek also divided many communities um, and that, that the people often saw the creek as a barrier within their typical routes of passage and saw it as a way that neighborhoods got broken up and divided up. And so we looked for places where the creek could kind of transform that function and become a connector of different communities. This creek system spans from um, you know, almost 12 miles up into the upland areas all the way down to the bay. So it's this incredible potential connective spine between regions. Um, and we saw a lot of potential in that to um, spur more connections uh, at that larger scale, but also hyper, hyper locally, connecting pathways from schools, from libraries uh, to the creek itself, and also creating more connections across the creek to really link these different neighborhoods. And so we saw this as part of a very important conversation uh, with the public about building a creek constituency that featured these different elements uh, that we called mudrooms, floodrooms, terrace, tra terrace trails, and seasonal bridges, each one with a, a, an outdoor kind of gathering and education perspective that um, reflected the needs of the community around 
And so this work is synthesized in this kind of larger scale rendering and drawing what that we called Unlock Alameda Creek, which is about making these more uh, kind of acupunctural changes to the, the composition of the flood control channel itself for the improve, um, improved flows of sediment, for improved migration of fish, and for improved social connectivity. So these are just a couple zooms on that um, area. Uh, and, and I think stepping back, we also built upon some modeling that the flood control district had done to understand that this type of intervention could help move an additional 5,000 cubic yards of sediment every year to the bay, um, which could be a very important source of sediment for that long-term slow nourishment of annual sediment coming to the bay and helping these marshes, especially the marshes down um, at Eden Landing, which is the, this area here on my screen, um, be able to keep pace with sea level rise. So uh, down at the marsh's edge, the existing flood control channel um, doesn't really feed Eden Landing today with sediment. It has levees all along its edge, all the way out to the edge of the bay. Um, and our proposal was to really work with the many different partners working on this large scale restoration project at Eden Landing, the State Coastal Conservancy, um, in, in collaboration with many others, including the Flood Control District, to propose this breach to the Army Corps infrastructure. Um, this is, looks like a very simple move, but is, you know, in reality, a very, very complicated and hotly debated and much discussed uh, type of um, infrastructure change to occur. It involves a lot of different Army Corps permits and you know, transformation of regulations and maintenance guidelines um, set to maintain the channel and operate the channel, which everyone is contractually beholden to. It's a very complex conversation, but it would have enormous ecological benefit and really create this transition zone for those uh, migratory uh, fish species using this space to be able to transition from the saltier waters of the bay to the fresh waters of the creek. Um, and we also think it could be nicely nested into a recreational framework uh, for uh, creating a series of pathways and overlooks and educational moments to get people out to the bay to experience these vast and large scale ecosystems. Um, one, uh, and so this represents that kind of full uh, thinking around the project that interventions far upstream could have a positive resilient benefit for um, restoration projects, marshes, these important cushions for the bay edge downstream on the bay. Um, one of the kind of pieces of the project that we ultimately developed into um, a project that we're advancing now with the State Coastal Conservancy is, is shown in the foreground here. Um, this is the perimeter levee, and we've called this the Eden Beach Pilot, this gravel beach and berm. And this is um, related to thinking about how we can design more naturalized shorelines, even where we have highly urban, highly modified, highly built environments. Um, so this uh, kind of perimeter levee in the foreground we're showing here redesigned as a more naturalized coarse grain and gravel beach system that would be a little bit more my dynamic. Um, today, this system is a uh, riprap perimeter levy, and so our pilot project uh, is really thinking about um, pilot project in tandem with uh, many important partners, including the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, who really own and operate the property. Um, the, the project is really thinking about how we can move away from um, relying purely on riprap and think about more naturalized constructed shoreline conditions that might foster shorebird habitat and other bay ecological life as well as provide those layers of erosion protection and risk reduction. This work builds on some of the um, work done by SFEI with the Adaptation Atlas, which identifies this site as a potential site for gravel beaches. Um, and we've been working on this very small scale pilot as a proof of concept of this larger strategy that could be applied to the entire perimeter levy um, in tandem with the um, Eden Landing Phase Two restoration. That is the, the hope and the goal. And so, I can talk more about this in the q and I think it's very, very fine grain, um, no pun intended. We're looking at a wide variety of, of grain sizes and uh, material types for this pilot, but it's basically meant to look at a, gra a constructed gravel beach system as a replacement for um, and as a supplement to the existing riffraff. Um, and we're testing two different beach widths and material compositions to really understand how they perform both from an erosion perspective, erosion control perspective, and a habitat perspective. And so I think I'll end there because it hopefully it talks about the large scale aspirations of the overall project and proposal of redesigning sediment flows from upstream to downstream, but also some of the very localized considerations and um, uh, kind of tests, I think, frankly, that need to happen to be fully prepared for adapting to climate change.
And um, now I will pass it off to Richard, next presenter. Thanks, Gina. Uh, so, yeah, I am going to talk a little bit um, about uh, the Coma Creek project, which is uh, an extension of the work that we did within Resilient by Design. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Coma Creek itself, but I'm probably going to talk a little bit more generally about our design process and this idea of um, creating an adaptation toolkit that deals with some of the challenges that many creeks around the bay um, share and uh, you know an attempt that we have to develop design content that might be of value and use to other communities around the bay. So this is Coma Creek in South San Francisco. Um, uh, you hopefully remember it from our Resilient by Design uh, proposal. Uh, we are now looking at a, a sort of uh, a more constrained uh, design scope for a different purpose here. So we're just looking at the creek and the public land adjacent to the creek. And the reason for that is that um, our sort of grand vision um, served a purpose to sort of, um, as part of RBD to set people's um, sites a little further ahead into the future. Uh, but it also um, uh, wasn't uh, all that easily implemented by the local city. And, and so the city of South San Francisco asked us with continuing work to sort of say, what are the first steps? Like, and what can we do first up to uh, to start to implement change along uh, this creek. And uh, it's pretty clear that um, there's lots of things that can be done on Coma Creek um, in terms of adaptation. Um, and so this project was uh, funded by an SP1 grant. And then on top of that, also a um, priority conservation areas grant. And the objectives of those grants were aligned, but also slightly different. Um, so the three objectives that we are looking to address uh, within the project are um, managing flooding and sea level rise impacts and adapting the creek um, for that purpose, uh, then looking to restore um, natural and native ecologies along the creek, um, uh, but also about public access. Coma Creek as a, as a corridor, we identified it um, as a sort of key link between the community and the shoreline that had been severed by um, a number of major pieces of infrastructure over time. And um, not surprisingly, we weren't the first ones to have that idea and the Plan Bay area also identified uh, this corridor as a key link to the Bay Trail. So that's largely where this project's being funded by. And this was a sort of concept within Resilient by Design um, that we um, started, started us looking at Coma Creek and that sort of became the motivator for developing a regional toolkit is just the number of creeks around the bay um, and the opportunity for those creeks to connect communities back to the shoreline and to sort of be the first steps in adapting to rising sea levels and overcoming a number of those barriers like freeways and rail uh, corridors that have created this sort of you know this circular um, connection around the cities of the bay and severed that direct access to the waterfront. So the way that we started the project is that we um, uh, try to bring together our working group around a set of principles and explaining uh, what's our ideal approach to design across a number of different categories. So those three objectives translate into a set of principles in terms of water, ecology and access. Uh, and we've adopted the hashtag let it flow because we find it catchy and everybody likes frozen. Um, so. Um, we, we look for opportunities across um, these different objectives that uh, either align or have conflicts so that we can start that discussion early within the project. And so in terms of water, we're looking at uh, ways that we can increase the capacity of the canal through um, the shape that we create, but also how that might open up, you know, better visual access to the water. Um, the canal's designed at the moment around a uh, worst case scenario. And so we're looking for ways that we can design it for different levels of inundation that happen sort of daily or annually or every 10 or 100 years. And we're also sort of looking to um, gradually move from this concrete um, uh, canal into a naturalized creek. And we understand that there's gonna be some hybrid sort of gray green solutions along the way. Uh, in terms of ecology, we we really think that there's a an opportunity with this project to um, with all these creek projects to allow people to have access to nature, and that's a, a key element here in the city with a lack of open space. But we're also importantly trying to uh, design connected 
nature along this corridor and we talk about sea level rise and creeks, there's a need for transitioning zones of um, habitat as a sort of fresh brackish and saltwater zones shift over time along the creek. Uh, and with all of that considered, we also want to make very lo-fi solutions so that the, the community um, can be involved in planting, participating in the restoration and stewardship of the project. And then finally, in terms of access, it's really about getting people access to the water, um, but also getting them access along the creek corridor to the shoreline. And there's a number of different constraints around how to make that access um, equitable uh, across the community and how to make it safe. Um, but there's also lots of opportunity um, uh, within the corridor to do this in different ways. So looking across our site, I just want to highlight a couple of key maps um, that drove the project, the, the FEMA flood zone that, that exists along the creek. Um, and, and then also uh, the access piece. So clearly there's a, an opportunity that if we can solve flooding challenges along the creek, we may be able to deliver more direct access than the, the city's current bike plan that takes people a long distance from the creek to move to the shoreline. And we started the project uh, in South San Francisco in this stage by looking at the different sections that happen along the creek. So there's a whole range of different conditions, but we looked at 12 typical sections and sort of showed the creek width changing from 40 feet, you know, and changing shape and depth all the way um, down to sort of, you know, close to 180 feet at the shoreline. And within each of these sections, we also looked at those um, various flood levels, whether it's a daily water level and the tidal change zone, or whether it's a 10 year flood, a hundred year flood, or even, you know, one, two, and three foot of sea level rise. Um, and what we were able to do is sort of define different character zones along the creek. And we think these are typical of a number of different uh, situations that occur along all creeks around uh, the Bay Area. So whether that be um, when a creek runs through a park and there's more opportunities for programming to engage with the creek or whether there's a street or a linear park running parallel to the creek that offers opportunities for adaptation, all the way through to these sort of tangled intersections of the Caltrain corridor and 101. Um, and the constraints around getting over and under those barriers and down to the bay where we sort of address sea level rise uh, risks um, in a kind of completely different profile to what we start with uh, upstream in the park. So our approach has been, uh, been to sort of build a toolkit, which is a tricky thing because we, um, uh, we want to create a, a wide variety of options for people to apply to different um, scenarios, but we also want to very clearly explain what the pros and cons are of doing different things in different situations. And so it's a really expansive design process and there's, you know, all sorts of testing of how we can add to and subtract from the existing creek. And how does that relate to uh, the sort of naturalization and restoration effort? And then also how does that relate to the distance that people are from the water or the people are from nature um, in those restored sections? Um, and uh, we distill all of that into um, this piece of work that's almost finished. This is in draft format that I'm sharing with you guys, but um, basically a, a suite of adaptation options that are defined by those different character zones. Uh, and then each of them being assessed against those principles that I mentioned earlier, but really assessed against the three high level objectives of, um, of ecology, water and access or connectivity. Um, so pretty expansive document, um, but we're also looking to sort of acknowledge the fact that sometimes um, adaptation may be taking some low hanging fruit and looking for low cost, high impact solutions. And other times it's important that we set a long-term goal and say, you know, we have to completely remove a street in order to um, expand a creek in, a, in a, an area of particular flood risk or, or in need of, um, of restoration. So I'll quickly skip through some of these areas because we could talk about all sorts of different options. But what we're, what we're looking to do is to mix different types of access, whether that be um, inundatable, like sort of within uh, the flood zone, areas that might go underwater every year or every 10 years, also changing the conditions of the edge um, 
uh, in terms of uh, treating stormwater running into the canal, layering that also retention um, built into the side of the creek. Uh, and then in terms of access, we're sort of playing with uh, how we can get um, the successful multi-use path to continually connect between each of these settings. So that includes, you know, sometimes having to move onto street side paths as we go under or um, around 101 um, and also using, um, you know, converting freight line into um, an accessible trail in order to take advantage of connecting under 101 all the way down to the shoreline where we're looking at sort of future sea level rise scenarios and the need for um, uh, migrating uh, marshlands as well as potentially detention of stormwater separate from, from protection from sea level rise. So uh, eventually we apply these, uh, the toolkit in the Coma Creek to a number of different scenarios and we sort of look at uh, each of those different zones and creating this continual access path, as well as this sort of transitioning uh, zones of different ecology restoration from the park all the way down to the shoreline. And, uh, and we assess uh, three key scenarios based on um, investment and, uh, and return on that investment, but also based on, on which additional parties need to be brought in to deliver um, these different routes. So, uh, that's been our process and I just wanted to quickly talk about engagement. We might talk a little bit more in the Q&A about engagement, but we had a really successful um, engagement program happening last year and um, there was a lot of uh, young people in South San Francisco really interested in the project. Uh, this is the summer camp that was run in Orange Park um, and we had some creek walks going on up and down and then COVID hit and um, <laughs> And so I think it's a really interesting time for community engagement. I think there's a lot of space for um, innovation. So what, what, we, um, what we did was we actually used the, the principles diagrams that explained our approach to create a storybook. Um, Christina lives by a beautiful creek and, and the idea of the storybook is that it's told from a future perspective from a young girl that, um, that has a restored creek as sort of like a key part of her daily life in South San Francisco. Uh, and uh, we put it online, it's in four different languages. We've, we've um, done a print run of about 200 books that are being distributed around different community groups, the Mothers Group, the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, and the bottom left there, you'll see um, council member Mark Nagalas from South San Francisco, his two kids. He, he did a reading online and that's been shared by the city, the Parks and Rec Department. Um, we sort of took advantage of the fact that parents are stuck at home trying to keep their kids entertained and interested in things. Um, and it's been uh, really successful. So um, uh, Elizabeth Sunshine and the team at Civic Edge um, helped to sort of drive the outreach around this piece. But I think it's just um, one way that we as designers can start to use our design process to sort of directly translate into engagement material, but also how we can use it um, in these crazy times um, to uh, keep people engaged in, in restoration projects and adaptation projects. Uh, and on that note, I'll pass back to Amy for the Q&A. Great, thank you. And thanks to John and Gina and Richard um, for those fabulous presentations. Um, we did have some um, questions we wanted to ask the panelists, and lots of great questions are coming in on the Q&A. Um, Gina is um, uh, typing um, furiously, answering um, many of the specific questions about Alameda Creek, which is great, uh, and we'll um, try to get all these questions answered either uh, right now in the in the box or live or uh, afterwards and share with everybody. Um, before we go to some of the Q&A questions, um, I do just want to ask the panelists and I'm going to combine uh, a couple of our questions. Um, so, you know, for us, obviously, sea level rise and climate change and um, adaptation to climate change are uh, critical issues, but um, you know, you could say that they've been eclipsed recently by um, by other issues such as um, 
COVID-19 and the associated stress um, to public health and to our economy. Um, obviously, we're also dealing with um, other um, uh, social issues uh, in this country that are more um, pressing on a day-to-day -day basis to um, communities and particularly communities of color and uh, under-resourced communities. So thinking about those um, crises facing um, our country and our communities, um, you know, what impacts have, do you think those have had on your work and on the public agencies um, undertaking this work? And in terms of, you know, engaging communities in this long-term um, adaptation planning, um, you know, how do you think about that um, when there are, um, um, you know, much larger or more um, imminent issues uh, impacting communities? So maybe um, we can just go in the same order. Um, you don't all have to answer, and that's a lot of questions being thrown out there. Yeah, how do, how do we uh, solve all the world's problems? Um, but John, maybe you can take a stab at it. Yeah, I think I think it's a it's a really interesting question, and it's definitely one that has challenged um, you know my clients and the projects that we're in the midst of. There was really we were really starting to get um, I think within the region and within our culture a lot of momentum around uh, how we're going to respond to climate change and in particular sea level rise, um, and. I think that conversation has, has changed a little bit, but I, I guess I would argue that we we have to be able to do multiple things at once. Um, the fact that um, the impacts of, of climate change is, is going to be affecting um, all of our populations. Um, and when we think about, you know, beyond COVID and beyond the economic stresses, when we just, when we begin to, to, to recognize the incredible uh, racial injustice that's been occurring in our, in our country, in our communities, and then you think about the impacts of, of climate change and sea level rise, um, you know, we're going to be impacting um, our underrepresented, our underserved communities uh, in, in incredible ways. That, and if we're not out in front of that, if we're not advocates for that as part of the work that, that this panel's just been talking about, I think RBD was, was, was engaging with heavily, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna be back in the same boat. So we, we have to use this moment not to, um, really not to be distracted, but to, be, to continue to recognize the, the broad impacts of sea level rise. And the fact that these things are all related. The disruptions associated with COVID are going to be mild in comparison with future disruptions to health, uh, future disruptions to infrastructure um, based on the impacts of sea level rise. So if anything, this should be you know, a, a, an additional wake up call. And we're going to continue to see, and I, I think Hank Ovig uh, did a, you know, an interesting job talking about this, just the related effects across our globe of, um, of climate change. And I think we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. Um, our clients are immediately impacted. Their parks departments and their budgets are are already thin, and they're they're burdened with um, planning for uh, major sea level rise and uh, climate changes uh, within our within our communities. It's going to it's going to take multiple partners, and it's going to take a, a reprioritization of, of funding. Yeah, Don, I I totally yeah. agree. Um, I mean, I think the the climate crisis and the equity crisis are so inextricably linked. You, have to talk about them together. We have to be addressing these things together. Um, I guess the, the thing that I feel like I have no answer for, and I would love to have more kind of group conversation here and other platforms are, what are the ways that projects that are adapting to climate change, whether it's sea level rise or heat, which is a big issue, especially with the COVID crisis, like emerging here in New York City, where I am based and I'm located today, um, how, how can we begin to tackle these questions, but how can we also rely on uh, innovation and bring innovation and testing and creative thought um, into, these, into these conversations? I think there's a great fear around sea level rise, there's a great fear around urban heat island effect, um, and there's a desire, I think, to propose things that uh, are well tested, are true, people understand, people acknowledge uh, that, that have been effective in the past, but yet we see so many ancillary negative impacts from so much of that infrastructure from levees that disconnect communities and are highly vulnerable, like our office works in 
um, has an office in New Orleans and you know many uh, disadvantaged populations were obviously very highly impacted by the collapse of what a you know, tried and true engineered levy system proposed to do. Um, and so how, how do we, uh, in, this, in this moment of social kind of reckoning and reckoning with the climate crisis, do we also think about experimentation and testing new methods and developing new methods collaboratively that address these um, kind of multi-purpose needs that we all have? I think those are really big questions of how do we, how do we experiment and how do we test to do these? Because I don't feel like we have the right toolkit of solutions yet to put forward. Yeah, I'll, I'll only add to it quickly so we can get on to another question, but I think um, it's important that we focus these um, adaptation projects on underserved communities. I, I know that we tried to uh, connect our engagement to some sort of understanding of what um, people are going through sheltering at home. And I think you can see uh, you know, that access to open space is clearly not um, equally distributed across the region. Uh, and that's like really important for mental health. That said, some things these projects just can't address, which are the real inequities around employment. And, you know, or there's a whole other side to what's going on, which I don't think um, uh, we can speak to in some of these projects. It's, it's almost just sort of like two tiers of, of um, how this is impacting people. And I just don't want to, you know, not acknowledge that some people have lost their jobs and are really, really struggling um, on a different level to just access to open space, yeah. Okay, thank you all. And yeah, we could spend another, well, not just hour, but weeks and months um, talking about um, the intersections of, of many of these issues. But I, I think it's, um, it's critical and it is our work. Um, um, it's not, um, I think racial equity is not some, you know, separate thing from um, the climate change adaptation um, that uh, many of us are involved in. It's, it's all very um, uh, tied together and extremely complicated. I did want to um, switch gears just a little bit, although it's all related. There were some specific questions about the funding for these projects and the status of all three projects in terms of funding and permitting, um, the status of, I think there was a specific question on that for Alameda Creek. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering how you all see it uh, in terms of um, the schedules and, and fundings for your funding for your projects. And there are some sources of funds in the Bay Area for this work, um, uh, local and, and regional and, and state bond funding, e even federal funding um, through the core and others, but um, specifically for your projects, what, what's the outlook? Yeah, do you wanna go in the same order? Um, well, I'll just chime in that um, for the work in Marin, some of that was actually um, uh, nature-based adaptation um, uh, funding to, to specifically promote that as well as understand restoration. Uh, there's also transportation dollars at work there. Um, so I think that's somewhat of a unique project in that it, it is truly a hybrid of, of funding sources. Um, our work in the in the East Bay is Caltrans funded. It's transportation dollars, and those dollars, though, are being applied towards a resilience strategy for for that infrastructure. And I think we're going to see a lot of a lot of agencies and municipalities, you know, follow the the money. And if it's transportation, we're going to orient it around a bay trail. If it was marsh and restoration, we're going to focus on marsh and restoration. The work has to happen either way. Um, no, I, I would echo the, the kind of transportation funding. Um, it, it was a project I didn't have time to present, unfortunately, but the work that we're doing that really aligns with a lot of um, John's work along the Hayward shoreline is also a Caltrans funded project, a climate adaptation grant uh, that came through Caltrans because of the San Mateo Bridge approach and um, adjacency of marsh systems potentially providing some protection to that transportation infrastructure. So these things are very deeply nested. Um, the Alameda Creek project is moving forward in, in kind of very distinct and different ways. It did get some um, 
diverted some funding the, the, from the state for, for some of the flood control uh, potential improvements. I don't have a great status update on where exactly that is. I think there's still some determination around how that funding will be applied. Um, we were really excited to, um, with the State Coastal Conservancy and Amy here, um, received a grant from uh, NIFWIF NOAA Coastal Adaptation Grants to advance the Gravel Beach pilot to kind of do that more experimental uh, research and design to lead to the implementation of that project. Um, and then I, I also think some of these projects has also just helped shift the greater conversation um, around issues of like in our, I think our case, like sediment management in the Bay Area and help enhance like the general perception uh, and, the, and the urgency, I think, around many of these questions. And so I think um, and the projects I think are valuable in terms of like how they're funded and how they're permitted, but I think the projects are also really valuable in how they're able to influence Baywide understanding of uh, potential ways we can adapt, maybe more experimental ways we can adapt beyond the levee walls. Yeah, similarly, um, Caltrans funding for us. I think it's fantastic that the freeways might be giving back <laughs> a little bit because there's certainly um, a barrier um, to creeks all around the bay. Um, we also are in a um, fortunate situation that San Mateo County uh, have just been such great leaders in the Bay Area in this space and um, they've recently formed the Flood and Resiliency um, uh, Unit, which uh, uh, has had I think over 20, 20 cities sign on from the from the county. So um, there's a whole new um, sort of potential stage of adaptation opportunities in San Mateo County thanks to that leadership from Supervisor Dave Pine and the rest of the county. So I'm going to have to jump in here. I'm, I'm so sorry. This is such a great conversation. It's hard to contain it all within an hour. So many great questions. Um, thank you, Amy, for moderating and for Richard, Gina, and John for your excellent presentation. I think everyone really appreciated your presentations and all the information you shared. Um, and you have before you a view of what uh, our session for next week. We have, we're going to dig into work that's been going on in Deep East Oakland. Uh, and then also jump back and look at the Adapting to Rising Tides Bay Area project and, and, and actually apply some of the findings in that study to the work in East Oakland, all moderated by Professor Christina Hill from UC Berkeley. So I want to thank you all again for your time. Um, thanks to our presenters, and I look forward to seeing you all soon. Thanks. <laughs>